Hey, this is Brock Lemires, and we're going to continue our study of embedded systems design by looking at computer hardware. And the point of this video is really about uh, terminology more than anything else. Uh, we're kind of going to flow out, do a block diagram of the major components of a computer. And <clears throat> this isn't intended to, to make you a hardware designer. It's just to basically give a, a rough overview of the main components and the terminology that we're going to use throughout the rest of this uh, rest of the videos uh, to describe what's happening within the computer. Okay. All right. So let's begin by kind of thinking about computer hardware. Okay. So we talked about this notion of this finite state machine that is going to be implemented in hardware and uh, it's going to have, you know, states that it does its stuff, and it's going to have different paths through this that represent executing different instructions. Okay, so let's just do like three instructions. <clears throat> and who knows how many states they take once they get into their instruction path, but we'll just kind of draw it like we'll do that just to make sure that it's obvious that <clears throat> these are different ones. And like we've said, I mean, this is going to be, this represents, you know, instruction A, for example. This represents, uh, this path is instruction B. This one might be instruction C. And we talked about how we are going to provide operation codes uh, to the finite state machine to basically tell it which path to go down as you execute uh, an instruction, okay? So we need a way to create storage, or we need some block in here in the computer hardware to actually hold the opcodes. And that's going to be accomplished with what we call program memory. Okay, so we're going to have program, program memory. Okay, and it is going to be, you know, a block that sits over here, and it's going to hold, you know, the opcodes and operands. <clears throat> and this is memory that you are going to absolutely download opcodes into after you develop your program. And this will then be read by the state machine as it walks through each location in memory and plucks out the opcodes and then decides which path to go down. And then once it gets done, it goes back and repeats. <clears throat> now, the execution of a particular instruction, you know, it really kind of takes place at this level right here. So it's once you get down these paths. But this state machine also is going to have the functionality in it to actually go out to the program memory and get the opcodes, okay? Get the instruction that is going to be executed. So this state machine is gonna take on kind of this three-stage architecture, which consists of a fetch, which means go out and grab the opcode from program memory. Then it's gonna do a decode, which is going to be determine which path determine which instruction you're actually going to be executing. <clears throat> and then it goes into the execute stage, and that represents these paths through the state machine down here where you're actually doing whatever that instruction wants it to do. An instruction could be, you know, add two numbers, uh, move information from a register to another, to memory, or move information from memory to a register. So this fetch, decode, execute is going to be kind of this continuous cycle that this state machine does, okay? And we're actually gonna give this state machine a name uh, because it really is uh, in control of everything. And so what we do is we call this the control <clears throat> unit. So when you hear a uh, computer, you know, a computer control unit, you're talking about the massive state machine that knows how to fetch and decode every instruction in the instruction set of this computer and also what to do with each of those instructions. And it knows which instruction it's executing by doing a decode of the operation code for those instructions that sits out here in memory. <clears throat> okay, so we have our control unit and we have our memory out here. Well, this is program memory. This is where your software is gonna go. But in addition to that, we also need memory for just interim storage, okay? So sometimes you need, you know, you need RAM, uh, for example. <clears throat> and that's gonna be called data memory. And that's absolutely something that's going to be in all computers. And data memory represents just places that you can temporarily store information. So, for example, if you're doing, you know, you're executing instructions and you're going fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute, you might be doing something like adding numbers together. And let's say that you're trying to add a like a number that's a 256 bits wide, but you're 
you know, your uh, hardware only has a 16 bit adder. And so you have to add it uh, word by word. And so as you create these interim sums, you might need to, to store the information somewhere and you can use data memory for that. Okay, that's just one example, but you use data memory all the time to hold variables uh, that change in real time. So we have this data memory that sits out here. We have the program memory, which is gonna hold on to basically where we put our software. And then we start thinking about other things that might need to exist in the computer. Well, one of the things that you're gonna need is gonna be registers. Okay, so you're gonna have registers. And what registers are, if you recall, they are fast storage implemented with, they're basically just a, a bank of D flip-flops that, uh, that holds information. They're synchronous and they have enables so that you can control when information is loaded into them and when it's not. And so you're gonna have these registers and you're gonna use these registers to do a whole bunch of uh, functions. Uh, some of these registers are gonna be dedicated and some of them are going to be general purpose, okay? So we'll call it G, we'll just go GP right there. <clears throat> and these, we'll go through some specific dedicated registers uh, in some general purpose ones, but I'm just gonna kind of draw them like this. So they just represent, you know, fast storage that sits within the computer. And then we also talked about, uh, we talked about, you know, I'm gonna do an instruction that adds two numbers together. Okay, we just, we just kind of mentioned that in passing. Well, it's important to know that a finite state machine doesn't do arithmetic. Okay, all a finite state machine does is it <clears throat> goes to a different state based upon an input and at each state, and depending on the input, it'll produce an output. So we can, at the fetch, we can produce signals that go out to the memory and bring information in, but <clears throat> we don't really have any place to put them, right? So this finite state machine can't add numbers, it can't store information. So we talked about the need to have storage and that's what registers are. So for example, you know, you could take the op, op code and put it in one of these dedicated registers. But then if we went to try to add something, we don't have the circuitry in here to do anything unless we add in uh, another piece of hardware, which is going to be called the ALU. And that stands for arithmetic logic unit. And this is going to be all the combinational logic that we put in our computer to perform all the operations that we want. So you can do plus and minus. You can do ands, you can do uh, inverts, <clears throat> any, so basically any instruction arithmetic or, or instruction logic has to be implemented in combinational logic within this ALU block. And what's gonna happen is that when you execute any, any of these ALU instructions, uh, the control unit will know to go out and configure the ALU to get ready for its operation and it will know what to do with the result once it's done. <clears throat> You, the ALU is gonna operate on registers most of the time. So you're gonna say an instruction might be take this register, I don't know, maybe it's called R4 for register four and R5 and add them together and maybe put them in R6. And so it's gonna, that instruction will know to go get R4 and R5, feed them into the ALU and then feed the sum back to here. Okay, so now this part right here represents a, this is actually what they call the central processing unit. So if I draw, block around this, okay, we are going to have the central processing unit or the CPU. And so when you talk about a CPU, these are the components of it. It is the control unit state machine that knows how to execute every instruction, but it also knows how to fetch and decode. Uh, it, it knows how to do the fetch and decode operations in order to get the opcodes out of the program memory and bring them over into here and then actually execute them. It also contains fast registers, and there, some registers are dedicated to actually helping get the opcode. Uh, and then there's other registers that track status, there's, and then there's general purpose registers that we can directly write into. And then also we have the ALU. And so when we draw a block around that, that's gonna be called this central processing unit. Okay, so then out here we have memory, <clears throat> program memory and data memory, absolutely. And it turns out that the one thing that we have not talked about yet is, inputs and outputs. So at this moment in time, we download our program in here and this thing can execute instructions, but we have no way to access the external world. And that's kind of a useless uh, device when you don't have input and output. So one of the things that uh, you have to have on a computer is called an input output port bank or an input output system. And this is gonna be as simple as just having like a parallel bus of pins, you know, maybe six, eight or 16 pins that you can write digital values to. 
This is also going to include maybe a serial interface. Uh, it might include something like, uh, I don't know, it might include a lot of, of different ways to get in, in, in and out of the computer. But this is where the outside world accesses the computer. So if I'm sitting out here, you know, I don't, <clears throat> I don't get to come in and like mess with the ALU directly. I only get to put information into and out of ports. Okay. All right. So now, one of the things that's interesting about a computer is that everything that sits out here, so the I.O., uh, the data memory, and the program memory, it is assigned a unique address. Okay, so the CPU looks at this entire thing out here and it, and it accesses it with an address. And so I drew this a little... I drew this a little too big. I, I needed to leave a little gap in there. <laughs> but there's going to be uh, a bus system which sits in between here and it's going to be how you get information back and forth. And we call that, uh, as you might imagine, the bus system. And so these are going to be lines that, uh, you know, like address lines and data lines and control lines that allow you to get everything in and out of what this thing is right here, which is going to be basically a memory map system. Memory map is the term that we use for uh, everything out here is assigned a unique address. And that is kind of a just a general drawing of computer hardware. And so... That makes me pretty happy. <laughs> so is that guy. So okay, so let's uh, let's do this. Now let's go and let's kind of walk through these components a, one more time and we'll get we'll it'll help us kind of review, but it'll also help us kind of uh, understand a little bit more of specifically what's going on. So remember program memory. <clears throat> program memory, uh, here's the picture that we just drew, uh, much cleaner this time. Uh, program memory is going to sit out here and it's going to hold the op codes and also additional information that might be needed by an instruction. You treat this, you download your program into there, but during normal operation, it's treated as read only memory. Okay. On a microcontroller, honestly, or well, not honestly, yeah, honestly, double EEPROM is typically used for program memory because it's non volatile and you can remove the power. But program memory is where you're going to download your program. Okay. Then you're going to have data memory. Data memory is volatile memory usually, and this is gonna be memory that you can access with your program. So if you need to store some information temporarily out here, or when you set up a variable, it's set up out here in this data memory. Sometimes people use the nickname RAM for this. Uh, RAM is not technically correct. RAM means random access memory, meaning that you can access any address at any given time. Everything out here is RAM. Uh, so we tend to say this is read-write memory. That's the more correct term. <clears throat> Note that the central processing unit consists of three subsystems, which is the control unit state machine, registers, and then the ALU. Uh, and so that's what we call the CPU. And within the CPU, you can think of the control unit as executing this fetch, or, or not executing, conducting fetch, decode, execute. This cycle continues over and over and over as you walk through all of the uh, instructions in your program. And here's this, this picture that we've kind of been drawn, but a little bit cleaner. So every instruction that we are going to allow or, or that the designers of the microprocessor made has a path through the state machine. And so, and then as you add more instructions, you just have to keep adding more and more paths. Okay. Fetch, decode, execute. That's a critical, uh, concept. Okay. Now you have registers. You are going to have dedicated registers and general purpose registers within the register bank. And let's take a look at some of the ones that we might need. Um, Program counter is going to be a critical register within the register bank, and it's dedicated. And this actually holds the address of the next instruction in program memory to execute. So notice that we talked about how everything had an address. Well, who who is keeping track of what address we're at in memory, in program memory, uh, so that we know once we're done with a, a particular instruction execution, where to go next to execute. And that's the program counter. That's going to hold the address of the next location in memory to get the next opcode. Stack pointer is going to be, it's going to hold an address of this concept of a stack. And we'll cover this later, but it turns out a stack is a way to, to allocate memory dynamically. And when you do that, you're going to need an address to hold on to it. So that's, that's going to be a critical, uh, critical one. Status register is going to hold flags that basically give you information about what's happening in the program. So for example, if you added two numbers, you might need to know if the result generated a carry or if the result was zero. And you're gonna have flags within the status register that'll do that for us. And then there's a big one that you don't really get access to very, you can't access it directly, but the instruction register. Where does the opcode go when you grab it from memory? 
And it turns out there's a dedicated register in here that is called the instruction register, and that's where it goes uh, so that it can be decoded. General purpose registers are going to be ones that you can just access with your program. In the computer that we're going to be looking at, the MSP430, they, they call these R0 to R15. Uh, it turns out R4 to R15 are general purpose. So we actually have 12 registers that we can use by our program. And of course, you got the ALU. Remember, this is all combinational logic circuitry that can perform all the operations that this CPU will allow you to do. And then you have your ports. And this, this now allows us to access the outside world. And, and again, the term port represents when you you leave the chip and talk to the outside world, but it also doesn't dictate whether it's a parallel or serial bus. And so we'll look at that a little bit later. Here's the bus system now, finally, when we get more, when we actually look at this in more detail. The bus system re represents just all the signals that are used to move information back and forth between this kind of system that sits out here that where everything has a unique address. And if it's gonna have a unique address, uh, you're gonna have a memory address bus, so MAB, MAB, and that's gonna be sent by the CPU out to the memory system out here, system memory and ports, and it'll provide them the address of which you're accessing. You're gonna have a, a memory data bus, and that's gonna be the data that goes back and forth between the CPU and the memory system. And then the memory map, that's the term that refers or that describes that all this stuff out here, data memory, program memory, and all your ports are gonna be assigned a unique address. And that allows uh, everything to be kind of simplified out here so that you just, if you wanna to get to a port, go to an address and you know the port's there. If you wanna to go to data memory, you go to its ad an address in data memory. If you, if you need to get an opcode, you go to the address in program memory. Okay, so that is basically computer hardware uh, terminology, computer hardware block diagram. And we'll close it down right there. So uh, as always, remember to subscribe to my channel so that you're up to date on all the latest videos.